This is Miss D. And right now we're going to take a quick look at World War II. And I say a quick look because this is a topic you're going to go into much more detail uh, on when you get into global history. So I'm really just going to focus on the aspects of World War II that directly relate to the United States and especially the U.S. home front. All right. Even, having said that, um, I, I do have to give you a little bit of insight into what's going on in Europe and, and uh, Asia at this point. Um, you may remember it, we discussed World War I. It took a huge toll on Europe. Most of that fighting, if you remember, that was the trench warfare um, in, in France and in the Soviet Union. A lot of deaths really destroyed Europe, destroyed the, the continent of Europe. And what ended up happening is a lot of the economies crashed. And so what you tend to see in Europe is between the wars, you see the rise of totalitarianism. For those of you who haven't had global yet, um, what totalitarian is and the def definition is basically in the name. It means that you see the rise of leaders who, uh, you know, just have total control of their countries, just completely, politically, socially, economically. And it's a variety of political systems that can be totalitarian. For example, Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union, he's a communist totalitarian leader. Um, but we also have totalitarianism in Germany and in Italy um, with the rise of Hitler and Mussolini. And they are not communists. They are, in fact, fascists. And fascism and communism are two very, very different systems. Um, both totalitarian, but different systems. In addition, in Japan, um, Japan's a little weird. Uh, Japan has a military dictator, Tojo, who is a very, very powerful figure. But you can't technically really can't call him totalitarian because he does have to share power with the Japanese emperor. But anyway, these are the leaders. They're going to be key players in World War II. Um, you should know Hitler, Mussolini, and Tojo. They are going to be the Axis powers. They are the Axis powers. They're the bad guys. We're against them. We're against Hitler, Mussolini, and Tojo. Um, Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union is actually on the side of the Allies. He's going to be on the side of France, England, and the United States. I know, shocking. Anyway, at the start of the war, actually, Stalin and Hitler kind of had like an agreement and things like that. Hitler betrays him because you'll never guess. Hitler's a liar. I know. Like like that's his, like that's his worst crime. But um yeah, no, evil bad guy. And not only is he evil, he's a liar too. But anyway, um Hitler betrays Stalin and so Stalin ends up um joining the allies. So he's going to fight fight alongside the United States in World War II. All right. So this is something that you're going to discuss in detail in Global 10. But just really quickly, you know, the causes of World War II, Hitler was a very aggressive leader. He was out to expand Germany and expand its war-making powers. And instead of standing up to, them, to him and stopping him early on, the European powers um, followed a policy of appeasement. Appeasement is basically where... Um, if somebody's aggressive, instead of standing up to them and stopping them, you give them what you want. I know if you've ever, you know, if you've ever been in the grocery store and you heard a kid having a temper tantrum, you're like, mommy, I want a candy bar. And mom's like, no, you can't have a candy bar. I want a candy bar. And you know, and the parent is like, yeah, just take the candy. Shut up. And the kid takes candy. And the, you think that's good parenting? You're an idiot. The kid, now you've taught the kid to have a temper tantrum. The kid's going to be unstoppable because every time he wants something, he just has to whine and complain and you're going to give it to him. Same idea with Hitler. Every time he whines and complains, they're like, okay, just let him take Czechoslovakia. Let him take Poland. You know what I mean? And instead of stopping him, it just makes him more and more aggressive. And, you know, by the time they try to stop him, he's way powerful. Um, Another one is the Treaty of Versailles. We'll just skip down town to that. Um, some people argue that the the um, the Treaty of Versailles was just so brutal, like the the punishment it laid out on Germany, um, basically doomed its democratic government to fail and kind of opened the door for a leader like Hitler, a totalitarian leader like Hitler, to come in and kind of you know take this country that had been just abused and its economy was destroyed and and allowed for that those those circumstances allow uh, you know. Or, 
it, it like opens the door to a totalitarian leader like Hitler. Um, but the one I'm going to really focus on is the League of Nations. Now, remember, this should sound familiar. We talked about this after World War I. Woodrow Wilson, it was the U.S. president in his 14-point speech who actually argued in favor. This was his idea that the world needed a League of Nations. And that this was his idea that this would be a group that would help the world avoid war, that, um, you know, as opposed to fighting and things like that. And he promoted this idea. But yet you may remember that this idea of the United States never joined, even though it was Woodrow Wilson's idea, even though he promoted it, the Senate did not approve the treaty. The Senate, the U.S. Senate never signed the Treaty of Versailles. So the United States never join the League of Nations, right? You remember this political cartoon? We talked about it, that the League of Nations was, a, was always missing the United States. And as a result, the League of Nations was very weak. Because the U.S. was not a member, because it did not have all of the strong nations of the world as members, it was kind of doomed to failure, all right? Uh, and the reason why the Senate did not want to join the League of Nations, well, this should remind you, right? The U.S. policy was we didn't want to be part of the League of Nations because we were afraid it would pull us into European wars. And we wanted to avoid all that, right? We wanted to stay away. It wasn't our problem. We want to mind our business, right? Because what is that policy known as? The United States followed a policy of isolationism or neutrality. Those are the two words you may see floating around. But we want we did not want to be part of the of European wars. That's like what the political cartoon is. Um, the argument being, oh, well, these wars that are happening in Europe, they won't spread to me. And the reality is, is sometimes that's, that's just not possible. That, in fact, European problems can cross the ocean and does the U.S. can get pulled into wars. But anyway, um, but we follow this policy of isolation and neutrality. This has been, you know, for basically our history since what president was the first one to urge the country? He urged the country in his farewell address. He said, you guys should stay neutral, stay out of European affairs. That was our policy since President George Washington. OK, um, so and for the majority of our history, that's that had been our stand. But basically, once we get once Japan drops the bomb, um, drops a bomb on Pearl Harbor and we get pulled into World War II, that is the beginning of the end of our policy of isolation and neutrality. And today the United States is very much involved in world affairs. All right, uh, just so you're aware, there was a group known as the American America First Committee, just in case you hear that term thrown around, America First. Um, some people use it today. They may not realize, you know, what the history of that term is. America First was actually a committee that was um, basically said that the United States should not join World War II. They strongly, strongly urged the country to remain neutral, to remain in isolation. Um, Charles Lindbergh, that famous guy who crossed the Atlantic by plane, he was a big famous member of this group. Um, but basically... Um, you know, it was very popular. There's a popular belief. But once Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, forget it. It was too late. We were, we were going to war. All right. Now, you may remember um, after World War One, and if you don't, feel free to review those slides, re you know, review that, that presentation on World War One. But you may remember one of the big things was the United States got pulled into World War One. We did not want to be involved. We got pulled in after the, the sinking of the Lusitania and the Zimmerman note, if you remember that, if that sounds familiar. And because we had like a lot of trading relationships with the allies and things like that, it got us pulled into war. But after that, you know, our whole country was like, no, we're returning to normality. You know, we're, we're, we're going back to our policy of neutrality. And in fact, after World War I, the United States passed a series of neutrality laws specifically designed to keep our country out of European wars that we never wanted to get pulled into another war again. So what happens is, is when World War II starts, FDR's hands are really tied. FDR, you know, really, you know, our relationship, we had a much stronger relationship with, um, with Europe, with the uh, allies in Europe. We, we had strong relationships with Britain. We had strong relationships with France. Um, and he did not like Hitler. He didn't like, you know, these totalitarian leaders there. Um, you know, he was he was nervous about the Nazis. He, he, like when you go into global, you're going to see that Hitler ends up 
by the time the United States got pulled into that war, Hitler had conquered almost the entire continent of Europe. I mean, he, he was no joke. Um, but again, FDR could not just say, all right, United States, let's go help them out. His hands were tied. Um, the country really was not convinced that, that this war was our problem, that this was a European thing, not ours. But he did whatever he could, especially early on in the war, to try to provide some assistance to the European powers, to the Allies. Um, and so it was things like the destroyers for bases deals, right? So the law said, like, we couldn't lend money or we couldn't give aid to, um, to the Allies because they were involved in a war. So he did things like, oh, we'll trade you a destroyer for some land rights. So we're not, sell you know, we're not selling it to you. We're not giving it to you. We're just trading. And the Lend Lease Act, like, you know, well, hey, we'll just lend it. It's it's in our vital interest. It's vital to our defense. And we're not here to help you. It's just helping us. And, you know, so he had to kind of find these ways around the neutrality laws. And what happened is, I mean, obviously Hitler is a lot of things, but he wasn't a complete idiot. He knew that the United States was basically helping the Allies. And so he didn't want those supplies to get in. So basically he orders, I mean, he had, he was pretty infamous for his U-boats, right? Those underwater boats, basically submarines, sinking all of these U.S. destroyers. His, his Navy is going after U.S. ships. Anybody who's heading into Europe, he's going to sink them all. And so Roosevelt is like, well, if somebody sinks us, we're going to sink them back. So basically, even before we get involved in the war, we have an undeclared naval war. And again, this should sound familiar in World War One. It was the same thing there, that we were in this undeclared war with Germany even before we started fighting. Um, and, uh, you know, another thing we do is we place an embargo on Japan. I mean, it was obvious that the United States... Like we, we, we were sympathetic to the allies. If we, if we join that war, we're going on the side of the allies. It was obvious. And so with that, um, you know, it's in that context that on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. Uh, obviously, if you take a look at the map, it, it, like I said, it's, it was a matter of time before the U.S. got pulled into this war. So Japan is like, should we just wait? You know, they, they've already got an embargo on us. They're running out of fuel. Are you just going to wait for the U.S. to attack when it on its own? Or are you going to launch a surprise attack? And for Japan, Japan knew if the United States was going to come after them, our biggest naval base was in Hawaii in Pearl Harbor. Um, we had a huge naval base there. And obviously that naval base is the perfect place to used to attack Japan, right? Right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So it launched a surprise attack. Um, just FYI, the day after that surprise attack, uh, Japan ends up going after Guam and, and you know, one of our other um, countries in Asia that was a U.S. protectorate. So they knew if they were going to attack U.S. protectorates, it might pull us into the war anyway. So they, they got that surprise attack out of the way and it killed many soldiers. Uh, just a brutal horrible attack it's still remembered december 7th is a day uh, well actually show you the speech um fdr says december 7th 1941 is a date which will live in infamy the united states of america was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the empire of japan famous speech this date that will live in infamy uh, it's brutal attack i mean it was i i, I won't go into detail because i know we're short of time but uh just terrible with the bombs. I mean, they couldn't even, they were trying to get the, the boats out and there were sailors on the boats trying to race the boats out and they were sinking and uh, just so many people died just so quickly. It was just a brutal attack. And obviously once that happened, nobody believed in neutrality anymore. Everybody was like, oh, we're going after them. It's, it, it's done, you know. And uh, I, think, I think there was like one, only one vote against going to war. So again, a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about now is going to be very, very reminiscent. It's going to sound just like what we did in World War I. So basically it's a repeat. Once again, you are going to see a draft for soldiers, right? We talked about the Selective Service Act in World War I. It is also enforced during World War II. It actually had started in 1940. So it started, as you can see, this happened in 1941. So it started, you know, the year prior. Um, because they knew it was, like I said, the government knew it was a matter of time before we joined this war, probably before we probably got sucked in. So there had already been a draft for men. Women did serve in the army, but again, just like in World War One, we did not take 
battle positions, but it was more support. Again, nurses, secretaries, support roles, again, just like World War I. Um, what ends up happening is African Americans are drafted into the army, but again, there is segregation, so they have to serve separately. Um, and just like in World War I, you know, they were subject to, even though they were dying and, and fighting for the country and, and dying, they were treated horrible. Um, you know, in these segregated units. One that's just very, very famous and always honored is the Tuskegee Airmen. There's movies about it, the Red Tails and stuff like that. If you're interested, definitely learn more. Um, the Tuskegee Airmen, I mean, you don't understand. At this time, there was so much prejudice against, you know, black people about, you know, because there's not only the African-Americans, there's also people who are Latino. So it's Haitians and somebody from Trinidad and, you know, other Latin people from the Dominican Republic. But there was so much prejudice that they were like, oh, they couldn't figure out how to fly a plane. Only a white man can do it. So the fact that the Skeegee Airmen didn't just, they weren't just good. They were great. I mean, they were heroic. They, they flew so many, um, th their war record was impeccable. I mean, they were really amazing. Um, but again, they were subject to terrible racism. I could see like the Tuskegee Airmen, they weren't allowed to hold command. They, you know, even the officers, like officers clubs weren't open to them, even if they had that rank. It was terrible what they went through. Um, but they were, but they were really famous for their, um, the other group of uh, people who are very famous for their contributions is uh, Native Americans, uh, specifically the Navajo tribe. The Navajo Code Talkers are also really, uh, their contributions were very important. What happens is, is it, you know, the code that they used, usually like you would take, let's say a message, right? In English, you take the message and then you put it through a code and then you encode it and then you send it out. Well, the thing is, is if you're a code breaker and I am not, you have to be like really good at math and that is not my gig, but people who are like really good at puzzles and really good at math and stuff like that, they can usually figure out a code. Like they take a look at the message and they start seeing patterns. They figure out which ones are vowels. And like basically if they know the underlying language, they can usually figure out the code. It takes them a while, but people, there's people who are really great at breaking codes. And, and that was pretty standard. Like people eventually could get the code down. But the Navajo, what happens is, is they took like an English message, translated it to Navajo, and then once it was in the Navajo language, then they encoded it. So it was almost like a two-step process because I assure you, there were no Germans speaking Navajo. Like they didn't know these Native American languages. So forget about it. This code was never, ever broken. Um, and so even when the messages were intercepted, they couldn't break it. So um, this is the first war that Native Americans were drafted. They had only just become citizens. Um, Native Americans became citizens in the 1920s. So they did not serve in World War One. They were not considered ser they they were not drafted in World War One, but uh, Native Americans were drafted in World War Two. So as you can see, one out of three Native Americans actually served in World War Two. On the home front, again, should sound very familiar to what we talked about in World War One. Again, you needed women to step up and take on the jobs in the factories. You should recognize this picture on the left. It is. Infam it's like super famous. It's again, it's like a feminist icon, but this kind of we can do it that women were badly needed to take on these factory jobs. So there was all kinds of these posters and propaganda urging women to please come take these jobs. Um, you see the fashion changes, you know, this was like women start dressing and they're like overalls and, you know, to go to work and things like that. And as you can see, all these posters and women were, you know, they're welding and they're doing like, you know, the hardcore stuff, right? And again, same thing, African-Americans are also going to be taking jobs in factories, right? Especially African-American women. And what happens is, is because of the war, again, uh, you know, uh, uh, FDR was not, you know, like a granola liberal, you know, civil rights icon type guy. But, you know, for purposes of the war, he's like, listen, I don't have time for this stupid, you know, I don't have time for stupid prejudice. I got I got a war to win. I need I need you guys to hustle. I need you to crank out this stuff so I can't play these games. If a black person is going to take this job, you give them the damn job. And so he ends up signing an executive order and he prohibits racial discrimination in the defense industry. 
So you cannot discriminate. You got to give jobs black or white. He didn't care. You got to give him a job. So that's the first time you see like civil rights legislation, like, oh, you know, no prejudice. Um, and what ends up happening is it's during this time, you're also going to see like the double V campaign where, again, very similar to what we saw in World War I, where African-Americans are like, hey, wait a second, I'm, I'm fighting for equality. I'm fighting for democracy. I'm, you know, fighting for my country. And then I come home and I'm treated like garbage What you know, like, and this idea that, you know, in America, you're a second class citizen, but yet you're expected to fight for this country. And the double V campaign was all about this idea that African Americans should have more civil rights and things like that. So, like I said, World War One may have started the ball rolling, you know, in a lot of ways for the NAACP and, and you know, increased people's membership and the push for civil rights. World War Two is going to take it to like overdrive. So it's not a coincidence that you know, World War II ends in 1945 and the 1950s is that whole civil rights era with Martin Luther King Jr. and things like that, that the returning soldiers are like, we've had it, we're, we're getting our rights. Um, again, just like in World War I, you're going to have, again, rationing and price controls. Again, the government in times of war, the government gets more power. So, to, you know, so here the government is going to take control of the economy, just like we saw in World War One. So it's going to have an office of price administration. It's going to have a war production board. It's going to force people to ration goods, right? Because the idea is, is that the economy is not, forget supply and demand, forget all that, forget that. We need the economy. We need supplies to go to the war front. We need to support our soldiers and everybody else waits online you know? and that's the idea is that the supplies are going to go to the soldiers first and everybody left has to ration has to make do with less because the soldiers have to be served first so it's the same thing that we saw in world war one we see again with world war two and again just like in world war one the government will sell war bonds because by buying a war bond you are basically it is a way to loan the government money so that the government has money to fight the war. So as you can see, here's another ration book, but this is a World War II book. You can see the dates. You're rationing things like gasoline. And again, people are encouraged, instead of buying food, grow your own food. That way the other food that's produced can go to the war, can go to the, to the front and, and go to the soldiers. Now, one of the interesting things about World War II is is that if you remember, you know, FDR had kind of instituted all these changes. He had pushed through his New Deal. You remember he had his three R's trying to fight uh, the Great Depression. And basically World War II stops that Great Depression in its tracks, okay? Because what happens is, is you have all of this industry having to gear up to supply the war, right? So there's all these jobs where people are just cranking out all of these supplies, these war supplies. Uh, and unlike today, they're, they're being made, you know, there's a lot of factories, a lot of factory jobs. We're supplying not only ourselves, we're also supplying the rest of the allies. And so you see that income rises and unemployment goes down. You have all these men, suddenly, of course, there's no unemployment. You got, you got, you got too many jobs because you have all your workers. You don't have to give them jobs. They're too busy fighting in the war. So you certainly aren't going to have unemployment. All, all your citizens are off fighting. The, all your male citizens are off fighting the war. So you have no unemployment and a family income rises because now people are making money. So as you can see in the chart, Washington, D.C., you go from an income of a little over 2000 to over 5000 you know, in D.C. and Hartford and in New York, similar kind of thing from a little uh, from twenty seven hundred to like over four thousand. And you can see the unemployment, which spiked right in 1933. That was the worst year of the Great Depression. And you see going down, down, down. And by 1942, when we were in the midst of World War Two, boom, it's like really, really low. Um, the War Powers Act again. Same thing as in World War I and all the other wars that we fought is that, again, the president gains power and we have rights that you lose kind of that balance between your civil rights and your freedoms versus security, right? That during a time of war, 
the government can control free speech, that they can limit free speech, right? That was that, remember that decision about uh, uh, that the Supreme Court had said uh, that if it was a clear and present danger, that, you know, that the government can, can limit free speech. So it does allow for censorship. And again, the government has more control over the economy. Normally, we are a capitalist, free market, capitalist country. But during the war, the government takes a much stronger role and manages business on a level that normally would not be allowed. Um, this is something you have to be aware of. It, it's really a black mark on our country's history, and that is Japanese internment camps. Um, it, it's a tragic, a horrible thing that happened. Um, just incredible racism during this period. As you may remember, we said that Tojo, um, the, uh, the military dictator of Japan, remember I talked to you that in the earlier uh, part of this, of this lesson, um, the enemies, the Axis powers are basically Germany, Italy, and Japan. Well, what ends up happening is, is that the president decides that all Japanese Americans are potentially enemies to the country, that they cannot be trusted, that they have too much loyalty to their home country. So therefore they must leave their homes. They are literally pulled out of their homes put on trains and forced to go into these remote regions in the middle of nowhere and are basically imprisoned during the war. Uh, I mean, this is crazy, right? If you are a Japanese descent, if you're a first generation immigrant and children, these children are born in the United States. They have to, and they have to leave everything behind. Do you understand? Like you have a business, you got to close your business. You got to just leave. You just got to boom, leave by and you're gone for years. They were out of their home for years. You have a farm? Forget it. You just walk away. Like literally they came with guns and took people out of their homes. And you got to bear in mind, they did this to Japanese people. But we were also fighting Italy and Germany. And somehow there were no internment camps for anybody from Italy or from Germany. But, you know, those are white people. I mean, let's, you know, call spade a spade. It was pure racism. Pure racism. A, a complete an utter violation of constitutional rights. These people did nothing wrong. These were loyal Americans. These were American citizens, okay? This wasn't like, hey, I'm here on a visa, I'm visiting. I mean, these are US citizens. Their children were born in this country. They've been here for years. And I was like, nope, we believe you are a threat to national security based on your race. That's it, end of discussion. That was enough to make you suspect it. They didn't do anything wrong. They didn't do anything. That, that wasn't it. They were just happened to be Japanese. Um, and you know what's really messed up is the Supreme Court said, yep, perfectly fine. In the court case, Korematsu versus the United States, they, the, the Supreme Court said, yeah, sure, that's totally constitutional. To take U.S. citizens and lock them up based on their race? Absolutely. That's the founding fathers would be like, yeah, totally okay with that. I'm crazy. Um, that if you have a, and again, perceived threat. You, you know what perceived means? Means I think you're a threat. Not a proven threat. Not a like, hey, I got paperwork, I got proof threat. No, I perceive you. I believe you could be a threat. And that's enough to limit your civil rights. If I just think you could be a threat. And that because it was a national crisis, the government has all this excess power. Just like, you know, Lincoln suspending habeas corpus and the Alien Sedition Acts. But this one was really extreme. It was purely based on race. I am telling you right now, this one, Korematsu, is right up there with Dred Scott. Like, like if you meet a Supreme Court justice and you're like, you know, hey, you must be proud to be in the Supreme Court. Yes, I am. So explain to me how you decided on Dred Scott and Korematsu. Oh, like they'll be embarrassed. Like it's, it's terrible. Um, and basically Korematsu, what's really messed up is it has never been overruled. Korematsu has never been overruled. So people were like, you know, what's going to happen? You know, could theoretically, if we went to war with like Syria, could like Donald Trump start locking up Middle Eastern people? I mean, you know what I mean? Like that's right. Crazy talk. But everybody agrees that even though it has not technically been overruled, like basically all the legal scholars agree that this is not good law. Like looking at it now, people are like, this was the wrong decision. The same way everybody knows Dred Scott was the wrong decision. Everybody knows this is the wrong decision, but technically it's still good law. 
but it's been overruled in like a lot of more minor cases. But uh, if anybody even tried to do this, I'm sure it would, uh, you know, I, I would like to believe that my country is not so messed up that they would allow this to happen again. And that's what most legal scholars agree with on both sides of the aisle. This, you know, this isn't like a, a all legal scholars kind of agree. But it, it is, again, it's a real black mark that not only that it happened, but that the Supreme Court said, yeah, sure, it's fine. It's really messed up. Um, and again, just to give you an idea of like the level of the racism, like this is this is like how bad it was. Like it, it, it just was like I said, like it was like as if these people were not could never be Americans. Like that was always the fear that they would never be able to assimilate. They could never be true Americans because they were Japanese. And if you see the picture on the on the middle on the bottom, uh, that's by Dr. Zeus, you know, Mr. Green Eggs and Ham. Some of his cartoons are the most racist ever. Like a lot of people look at Dr. Zeus and they, they, they say like he shouldn't even be taught in schools to little kids because of his work was so racist during World War II. Supposedly later in his life he was like embarrassed by it and he like, you know, re regretted doing it. But this was completely socially acceptable to have this level of real racist stuff um, came out, you know. Um, Oh, just so you know, this is uh, anybody who's a fan of Star Trek. The guy on the bottom left should look familiar. That's George Takei. Everybody calls him George Takei, but supposedly his name is actually said George Takei. Um, he's famous on social media if you if you watch him. People call him Uncle George. He's like an icon, um, not just for his role in Star Trek, but today he's like a real icon for gay rights. But um, he actually came out with a book, the one in the middle. It's a graphic novel. It's all about his life because he, as a child, was sent to a Japanese internment camp. I actually bought the book, um, and it's it gives you like real insight into how horrific this like experience was. I mean, they were, they went from a house to like a shack, you know, in the middle of nowhere, freezing cold. It was just, it was brutal, the conditions they lived in. And, and, you know, as a little kid, like the parents going through everything. But anyway, if you have a chance to read it, it's a, it's a good book. All right. Um, so just finishing this up, like I said, FDR is the only president who is elected four times. Um, basically, like I said, by the, by 1947, they're actually going to pass an amendment. So that can't happen again. But FDR dies very, very early into his fourth term. Um, he's going to die right before World War II ends. And so as a result, he's going to leave office and we're going to get a new president. We're going to get Harry Truman. Um, Harry Truman is the man who approves the use of the nuclear bomb. Uh, you may remember the atom bomb is developed by the Manhattan Project, the plane that drops this bomb uh, is the name Enola Gay. And the argument was is that the U.S. should drop the atom bomb because people knew this was this bomb is the, the destructive power. Of this bomb was unbelievable. Um, but the argument was, look, if we don't drop the atom bomb and we don't finish this war, it's going to require the United States to invade the Japanese homeland to end this war. And so the idea was you were going to see a lot of deaths of U.S. soldiers, of Japanese soldiers. There's probably going to be civilian deaths because you're going into the homeland. Of course, the other argument is when you drop an atom bomb, you are not dropping an atom bomb and just hitting soldiers. You know, like your typical war, you, you shoot a gun, you shoot a bomb, you're bombing the other soldiers. You're, you're aiming at military people. When you drop a nuclear bomb, you take out entire towns. You get what I'm saying? So you're taking out men, women, children, boom, just in one shot. And the and it's, the destruction is massive. And it long lasting too. I mean, this is this is nuclear. I mean, you're giving people even the people who don't die get cancer and die. Like it, it the, the death toll is pretty brutal. Um, so there's an argument both ways. There's an argument both ways. Um, but nonetheless, like I said, it is dropped and it really changes the world, right? Um, to give you an idea of how destructive this bomb is, uh, it wipes out two towns, right? It's dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Wipes them out entirely. Um, in fact, if you see on the, the top left, that's a shadow that was captured. What happens is, is after the atom bomb is dropped, individuals are literally vaporized. There are people like if you are, I mean, there's the bomb site where, you know, as you can see on the bottom left, you know, where there's like concrete homes are just destroyed and everything's wiped out. But then even further out, the heat 
from the bomb, miles away from where the bomb dropped. I'm talking miles away. The heat was so intense that literally human beings were vaporized and they vanish. Like there's no remains left to bury or anything like that. They, they vanish and their shadows are left behind. So literally at the moment that bomb was dropped, this little girl was in midair, rump, jumping rope. The bomb went and she was vaporized. She, she was gone. And as you can see on the top right, again, miles away from this bomb, the heat from this just melts and just destroys the, you know, third degree burns and what have you. And again, cancer and it was just the scale, you know, just destruction on a scale that had never been seen before. Right. And this is the only time that nuclear bombs have ever been used in war. You know, we've built way more powerful bombs since. And, and that's a big topic you're discussing global. But this was the one and only time a nuclear bomb had ever been dropped in war. OK. And um, they dropped the first bomb and Japan didn't didn't surrender, you know, and then the second bomb hit. And then forget that the emperor came on the radio and was like, yeah, we, we give up. Um, so that's the end of the war. And I should say Hitler had been beaten before Japan. That that was the war in Europe. But the war in Europe, that was the one that really France and England were kind of more focused on France, England and, and Russia were more focused on the European theater and they were focused on Germany. Um, the United States was more focused on the war in the Pacific and fighting Japan. So Hitler had already been beaten. And then later the, the U.S. drops a nuclear bomb and that's what ends um, World War II. So it begins with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. It ends with the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and what ends up happening after World War II is, like we said, the uh, League of Nations fails, but you kind of have a replacement, which is the United Nations. The United Nations is created after World War II. And again, kind of similar to the League of Nations, the idea is that it's going to be a group that's going to prevent war and promote international cooperation. Um, as far as avoiding war, it's, uh, you know, kind of. Let's put it this way. World War II has not been our last war, so it probably isn't exactly batting a thousand on that one. But it does have organizations like UNICEF and like the World Health Organization that does allow for international cooperation for, for other emergencies. Um, it prosecutes war crimes, including the Holocaust. And I know, sorry, I, I don't mean to ignore the Holocaust. I promise you. Um, it is a huge topic that is covered in Global 10. If I had the time, I would cover it here, but I, I don't want to disrespect it also by doing it too fast. But Obviously, that's what Hitler's known for, is that he um, killed one-third of the Jews of Europe. Brutal. You will definitely discuss that in Global 10, if you haven't had it already. Um, and the United Nations will prosecute the Nazis, as well as Japanese people, for war crimes. That's the first time you see that, that happening. Um, and they're going to pass a UN Declaration of Human Rights, basically saying that that kind of behavior is beyond the pale and, and not acceptable. All right. So again, our focus really, though, is on the United States and the impact here. So what you should know is, so after the war ends, kind of, the, it has a big impact on the United States culture. You have now a GI Bill, otherwise known as the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944. So that means if you are a returning World War II veteran, like my own father, my father fought in World War II, and he was entitled to a GI Bill. So with that money, he was able to buy a home, right? And uh, other people use that money to get themselves a college education. So you see a large number of veterans going back to school and buying homes. And in this way, this is some of the biggest ways where that middle class people build wealth. Again, wealth is different than money, right? Wealth is different than money. Wealth is something that once you have it, it becomes worth more money as time goes on. Like if you buy a car, a car actually isn't wealth. You know get what I'm saying? Because today a car is worth a lot, but tomorrow it's going to be worth less. And the next day it's worth less. It goes down in value the longer you have it. But having education or buying a home, generally those go up in value over time. So that's like wealth. It, it builds. And it's something of value that you can pass on to the next generation. So having an education, having access to better jobs and a better future and you know, uh, and obviously having a home that your kids can inherit. This is wealth, and this is this really opens uh, a lot of options for middle class white male Americans. Okay, um, and it leads to a huge demand for housing. Right, all these World War One veterans—they're back home. 
they're thankful to be alive. They made it through the war. They're ready to settle down, have some family, have some kids, buy a house. They've got the GI Bill, and that's what they end up doing. They all run out to the suburbs and start buying houses. You remember we talked about suburbanization, that idea that you build houses outside of a city because you now have access to cars. And, of course, you're going to get these men home. They've been off fighting war. They come home. What do they want to do? Boom, boom, boom. Have lots of babies. Yes, that is literally a name for it. And it is called the baby boom. Because literally, after they got back from World War II, boom, bitter, boom, boom, all these soldiers start making babies. Oh, yeah. 4.24 million babies are born. So you see that red? That is actually the baby boomer. So literally, there were so many kids born after World War II. They're literally called baby boomers. So that's why they're called boomers. You say, hey, boomer. You are talking about that generation of people who were born right after World War II, that their parents were the World War II veterans. And again, suburbs, I, I live out in Nassau County, so we have suburbs like this. A lot of towns in Long Island, um, you know, were built really fast, pretty cheap and, you know, sold out to the uh, sold to these returning veterans. Now, as I said, that was for white men and they did pretty well uh, for themselves as returning veterans. If you were an African-American veteran, different story. Um, there is a GI Bill. However, those benefits basically really are focused on white men. Um, some women could use it to get an education, but really, again, women are kind of forced more into that role of being the housewife. And even if they wanted to go to school, a lot of schools were not accepting a lot of women. And again, there's, there's too much social pressure to become a housewife. Um, and African-Americans, again, you know, the people who are doling out these benefits, these are real racist. Uh, these are like the Veterans Administration generally run by like these racist groups that really push them towards vocational schools. So they were like, oh, just take this money, go learn a trade, go learn a trade. And you kind of get that kind of push. But also, even if you wanted to go to college as an African-American, you don't have that many options. Um the schools in the North, some of them don't accept or accept very few African-Americans. In the South, forget about it. I mean, you have straight up segregation, so they're, they're not taking you at all. Um, there were, if you, if you know about the name historically black colleges, those are colleges like Tuskegee University or Howard University, things like that. Um, there are historically black colleges, and those are found down South. But those schools uh, can only take so many people. You get what I'm saying? Like they're they're really, really overcrowded. And again, those schools are only uh, there's a handful of those schools and they're in the south. It, it, it's not an option if you're up in the north. Although there were some. I mean, my own grandfather, he was Puerto Rican and he ended up going to the University of Chicago. So they were open and they had mixed race classes, but it, they were the exception there. I mean, again, um, segregation is still the law. So colleges do not have to, to have to accept African-Americans. And a lot of schools didn't accept women either. And in addition, so the doors for colleges are basically pretty much closed. And it's the same thing with home ownership. Um, remember, uh, what happens is banks, the way after World War II, they basically had something known as redlining. And what happens is, is they would basically literally take a map and like draw a red line. And neighborhoods that were black neighborhoods, they would not make, they would not give mortgages to buy homes. And they said, like, these are bad neighborhoods. We're not, they're not good loans. We're not going to loan money to it. And the neighborhoods, like, you know, the white neighborhoods or whatever, those, fine, we'll, we'll mortgage them, we'll give them loans, we'll give them home loans. And then, so this was a barrier, again, to home ownership. Um, you got to remember, too, there were those restrictive covenants in houses. So there were certain houses that literally in the rules, it said this house cannot be sold to a, a black person. It can only be sold to white people. So you have between restrictive covenants and the redlining, literally it keeps African-Americans from being able to buy homes. And like I said, home ownership is the number one source of wealth, inherited wealth for most middle class families. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to review this with you. But if you have the time, please, you're on YouTube anyway, make time to watch this video. It is really good. It's um, Adam Ruins Everything. That was the name of the series. And he talks about the disturbing history of the suburbs. And again, this is government policy that affects African-Americans. And again, we're talking about 1945. Like I said, my father fought in World War II. This is, this is within, you know, a lifetime 
Um, this is not, you know, ancient history. And these are laws that were, these were policies and laws that were on the books that, that negatively impacted African Americans. And that's why, you know, even to today, where we look at income inequality between white and black in America, um, this is one of the driving forces of, you know, behind that. Obviously, there are some African Americans who have tons of money and there's some white Americans who, you know, don't have a pot to piss in. I got it. You know what I mean? There's poverty there. But again, it's more these government forces that kind of stack the deck in favor of one versus the other. There's no guarantees, but it's stacked the deck. So I really recommend watching this. It's a, it's a, it's a great, uh, it gives you a lot of detail about this. All right, so last thing is, we're going to take a look at 1950s culture. Again, Americans have more disposable income. They have lots of money, just like the 1920s. Just put that right in there. Now, we talked about the 1920s where people were buying vacuums and they're buying radios and they're buying refrigerators. Well, same thing in the 1950s. You see the same thing. And again, based on what I told you, so it's this is really for white families because white families have the best houses and the best jobs and the best schools because they're in the best neighborhoods. And they kept out anybody who wasn't white. This is era is very famous for its pop culture of the 1950s. If you recognize the guy in the middle, that is Elvis Presley before he gets fat, before he becomes a real messed up drug addict. But back in the day, he used to be really cute. Um, he's uh, he's actually pretty famous. <laughs> he's um, if you know uh, you know Eminem, right? He's got a great song, um, White America. But anyway, he talks about it like I am um, the. Oh, he, he says, one of his rap lyrics says, I am the worst thing since Ev Elvis Presley, or I'm the best thing, I think I'm the best thing to, since Elvis Presley to do black music so su successfully. Um, and he basically jokes about the fact and, you know, um, you know, tips his hat to the fact that with, you know, this idea of like a white person doing black music. Um, that's one of the criticisms of Elvis Presley. Although people do love him. He's, he was legitimately had some really great songs and, um, you know, things like that. But um, he was, you know, he was this like white face doing like a style of music that was uh, traditionally done by African-Americans. But anyway, but he was really hot, that whole 1950s culture, rock and roll. And, and now you have television. You finally have television. Um, not just the radio, you have TV. And, you know, everybody's watching their those black and white TV shows like I Love Lucy and Leave It to Beaver and all those TV shows are really hot back in the 1950s. And this is a period of very, very strict gender roles. Women are women, men are men. Women stay home and they sit in the kitchen and they just do this and the men go out to work and da da da. And this very strict, women are gonna put up with this by the 1960s, this is gonna explode. Women are just had enough. But the 1950s is very, very strict. And a lot of women, the, a lot of women grow very uncomfortable with, you know, how they're forced into these little boxes. And, and that's where you're going to see the rise of the women's movement. Um, it's going to start in the 1960s, really hit in the 1970s. Okay, with that, I am done. Thank you so much for your attention. 